were very deliberate in picking this particular segment of, uh, of topics to target for these webinars because uh, there's a lot of conversation happening um, on the macroeconomic side of things. Uh, we just didn't feel enough was being done uh, where it's most needed. And I think as Africa, uh, the one most common thing across all of us is, is things like informal settlements, the rural areas, uh, the challenges of public transport, and so we thought we'd put together some uh, of our thoughts and some of the people working in this space to showcase what's happening uh, so we can all learn. In terms of um, AVPA and who we are, uh, we're a Pan-African network um, of social investors and we bring together the whole continuum of investors. And when you talk about continuum is looking at people who are investing for impact, expecting either no returns or market returns. So this includes everyone from philanthropists to impact investors, debt and equity providers. Um, our mission is to increase the flow of capital into African social investment. So basically, how do we grow um, uh, social impact in Africa? And if you look at uh, why this is important, is that our traditional sources of capital for social investments in Africa that were uh, in the past things like aid and government funding are facing huge challenges and are dwindling. Uh, we, think, we think aid might even reduce further post-COVID as more people look to invest money internally in, in the West. And our governments are going to be a lot more broke than ever before. Um, and why we started this response is, is we, we asked ourselves when the COVID outbreak came about, is what can we do? And um, the first thing we thought of is we, we can bring together uh, communities of response. And we set up some platforms uh, uh, in our three regional offices in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. And those have grown exponentially. I mean, um, we have over 300 people now working on the platforms. And through this process, we figured out um, one of the things we could also do is help moving um, information around as quickly as possible, and sh especially showcasing solutions. And this is why these webinars were set up. So thank you for joining us. Um, looking forward to having a really good session with the speaker that we've got. I think it's pretty exciting. Please note that this will be running every Thursday, and we'll, we'll also be very deliberately bringing in speakers from the uh, different countries in Africa so we can learn from each other. Otherwise, uh, have a nice webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Nancy to make a few um, also, also remarks before we get started with the speakers. I'm, my mic was off. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar series. Um, we're excited. We, we had, I think, uh, over 150 people register for this. So we we know already that this is uh, much needed across the continent. Um, as Frank said, we'll be doing this every Thursday, and we'd like to hear from all of you uh, in terms of what would you like to hear? Who, who would you like to hear from? What topics do you want us to focus on as we move forward? Um, I'd like now to uh, go to our first poll. We'd like uh, uh, to do a temperature check on those who are on the call today, just to find out um, who, uh, out of all those on the call today, what are you doing around COVID? Have you started any COVID uh, initiatives? So, Margaret, if you can put up the first, yep, yeah, there it is. Uh, has your organization started any initiatives in response to COVID-19? Uh, just give us your your uh, response there, and then we'll look at the results. If you haven't yet, that's fine. Uh, we know that a lot of people are are still struggling to find out, you know, to to really identify what they can do as uh, individual organizations. So, um, any responses yet, Margaret? Um. Yeah. Yes. This. People are responding. Can you put Just a, give them like one more minute and then we can um, close it. Okay. I think we have we have uh, people from across the continent and uh, even uh, from Europe and the US, I saw on our registration, uh, we have some people from um, Europe and, and, and uh, the US. So it would be interesting to, to know how many people have actually started um, COVID-19 uh, responses. 
the responses are still coming in. So okay. far we had 58 people. All right. So those are around 80% who have already voted. Wonderful. Okay, maybe we can put up what you have so far so that we okay. move on to the uh, move on on the program. Okay, so not yet, but we are planning. Uh, if you need any uh, help in terms of connecting with other people, we have a few initiatives that um, you know might help you as you're planning on how to respond. I'm glad to see that uh, uh, there's so, you know, so many, 80% who, who are, have actually started various initiatives. That's great. Okay, um, let's move on. I'd like now to introduce our first speaker, Jay Larson, and uh, followed by Maureen Mora, both of them from Tunapanda Institute. Um, Jay and Maureen are working on digitizing curriculum um, and training programs for youth around uh, COVID-19. And Maureen um, will talk to us about, uh, she, she currently lives in Kibera, and so she'll be give, giving us a first-hand, um, uh, you know, understanding of the kind of challenges and um, the kind of, um, initiatives that she's seen in Kibera. Uh, over to you, Jay. Thank you very much. Margaret, you can put down the, the poll now, results. And actually, maybe Jay, before you get started, I'll just make a quick couple of housekeeping remarks. Um, uh, so for folks, if you have questions for the speakers, please put them in the group chat. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there should be a chat box. Um, the, the option for a chat box, so please do put them there. We will sort of reserve the questions for the end. So we've saved about 25 minutes at the end of this session just to, to, for question and answer. Um, also, please, you'll see a reactions button at the bottom of your screen. You can applaud, you can give a thumbs up. So if you agree to what any, any of our speakers are saying, please do feel free to use um, the, the reactions and the chat. And if you have, are having any um, technical issues, please feel free to, to sort of direct message my colleague George um, will help uh, to sort you out in the case of any um, video or, or connection challenges. Um, all right, perfect. Over to you, Jay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the introduction and thanks for putting this together. Uh, and thanks for everyone who's taking the time to, to arrive. Uh, my name is Jay Larson. I've been here in Nairobi for about seven years. And this issue, I think, is extremely important to everyone around the world, uh, not just in the context of COVID. But if we look at global population growth, I think most people here know that um, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, is going to be one of the largest growing populations in the next few decades. By 2050, it's estimated that 40% uh, of the world's children uh, will be here. Simultaneously, it's a very non-urbanized continent at the moment. A relatively small percentage of people live in cities. Uh, it's very rural still. That's going to change very quickly at the same time as population grows. So uh, estimates of at least twice as many, up to four times as many people will be living in cities. And when they come to cities, they're coming not, um, not to necessarily flee a rural hardship, although there are difficulties living in rural areas. They're looking for a better life. They're looking for a way to work harder, to, to meet other people, to be exposed to new ideas. And when they pass into cities like Nairobi, uh, like Lagos, um, like Accra, they will, a lot of them will pass through informal settlements. And so this is why, um, looking around the world of what, what to focus my life's work on, um, I focused on access to opportunities that help people get into the digital economy, to be creators, to have a voice uh, for their own communities. And so I moved into Kibera, uh, into the outskirts of Kibera, about six years ago. And I lived there for four years, um, right in the outskirts next to the first training program that we set up. We teach broadly technology design and business skills. And we support our learning with video content as well as interactive, uh, other interactive content. Um, and where I am Maureen, she graduated of our very first cohort uh, more than five years ago. And we've been working together ever since. And so the thesis that we came in with is that there's a lot of creativity 
a lot of passion, a lot of intelligence in these places. And then given the right tools and the right ability to correct, collaborate and the right skills, um, these places are not just something that needs aid or needs money. These are people who can create value and take part in, in the world. And I think um, having worked with Maureen and many other young people, we've seen that this is definitely true. And so I think my one message here, I mean, you know, we are working on some interactive content that can help people learn. More importantly, the content's gonna help people come together and teach each other. It's not just about sitting in front of a computer. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, in low income areas, people store a lot of their value in their social networks. And people don't wanna just sit on a computer screen or sit on their own, they need to be constantly interacting. So as we think of these learning activities, we also need to think about building networks. Um, and that is very, if there is any lockdown internet, uh, as I think DJ noted here, internet will be extremely important. And so we are creating these tools, but we're also empowering the young people who work on our team. And apart from me and my brother, all of the team members at Tunaponda are graduates of our training program. They come from, from uh, these types of areas and they're parts of that community. And so we're gonna be creating content, but also engaging our team and our graduates and teaching each other within the area. And I think you know, um, that we wanna be taking an approach of involving people in the global economy and connecting people to opportunity. And that was true before COVID, it's true during COVID, and it will be true afterwards. But you know, Maureen and I uh, together experienced a small riot in Kibera about three or four years ago, uh, politically motivated, where some of our team got caught in a building. And we've seen firsthand what happens when people lose hope uh, and when people feel like they don't have an opportunity. Um, things do get violent, police do come in, tear gas does get thrown around. And so I think, um, our little thing is helping people feel connected with the hope that people um, feel like they can contribute and take part um, in the global economy. Uh, so um, I think that's pretty much it for me. Um, I've written on the topic of this in Professor Batangi and Demo's book, Digital Kenya, uh, and I'm happy to chat about this more, but I think Maureen has a lot more interesting things to say than I do. So thanks everyone. Over to you, Maureen. Um, thank you, Jay. Um, so maybe we can move on to the next um, slide. Um, as we're doing that, um, let me just give like a brief introduction of uh, who I am. Um, so my name is Maureen Mora, and I've been working with uh, Tunapanda Institute for five years or so right now. Um, I joined them as a trainee back in 2014. I went to the training program, and right now I'm in the management um, roles of the organization. Um, so for today's uh, webinar, I'm just going to talk about um, the life uh, of living in Kibera, especially during this pandemic and lockdown. There are a couple of awesome things that are happening on ground here in Kibera. But then again, at the same time, um, it is not reaching out to very many people. Um, so I, I don't know if most of us know um, Kibera and the stories related to Kibera. It's not all that bad, um, but I can say uh, the media is not doing like full justice to the positive side of the, the slums. And um, maybe go to the next slide. Uh, the next one again. Yes. Um, so one of the things that we are currently doing is, as Tunapanda Institute, is trying to create content to, um, about COVID-19 and just create awareness. And the reason why we're doing that, um, most of the people who live in low-income areas, especially Kibera, they do not have access to necessary material, materials and resources to have this information. Because most of this is, of information is online, like you go to social media, for example, Twitter, among other platforms, they do not have access to that. So there is information in Kibera at the moment about COVID-19, but it's not reaching out to everybody, especially people who are in the slums down there completely. And one of the things we are trying to do is um, we, we are currently trying to digitize our content um, and add on to the COVID-19 um, 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 information out there. And uh, the other thing is um, our training program um, used to be like one-on-one, -on -one, but as Jay mentioned, we are trying to um, help and ensure that it goes online so that 
the people who live in Kibera can have access to that content. And one of the ways we're trying to ensure that they'll have access despite them not having the necessary materials and resources is we're working on one project known as Tunapanda Net, which is a community network that is meant to um, connect um, different institutions, churches, schools, and also people who live in that area so that they can have access to this information. So on this other hand, we're creating content. On the other hand, we're trying to find the necessary materials and resources to connect them. Um, uh, the other piece that I think I should also mention is we have um, NGOs in Kibera that are currently also distributing food um, to uh, the different people, especially the elderly. Um, uh, the government has tried, but the last time the government was here to distribute food, there was issues. Um, a couple of people got injured, the food was not enough, because um, the people who are distributing ended up taking most of the food as well. Um, another organization that I think is also doing really great is Shofko. They are providing water um, and have set up different wash stations in different areas in Kibera so that people, as they're walking by, they're washing hands and they're also sanitizing. Uh, and we also have another organization known as Somo Africa that is uh, distributing Somo care packages to the elderly people. Um, and what do I mean? They give um, food, general uh, food materials like flour, oil, sugar, among other things for them to to take them for like a month. So there are things people are doing, but it's not reaching everybody within the, the slums. So there are a couple of things that I'd just like to point out uh, before I finish off is, there is distribution of food for elderly people and other people, but it's not enough or sufficient at the moment. Um, in terms of education, most of the schools in Kibera right now, they're closed down. Students cannot be able to study at home because they do not have access to these resources like internet or smartphones so that can go online and study. And then in terms of health, Shoko is trying, um, but it's not enough yet. Um, so I think that's what I had to share for today's um, webinar. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or ideas on how we can improve how we live here in Kibera. And um, yeah, so thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maureen. And thank you to everyone who's submitting questions. Um, I've seen some really, really excellent questions come in. Um, and we'll get to those uh, towards the end. Um, I think we're going to go to another poll, Nancy, right now, if you want to leave that one off. And, and Margaret, if you want to push that out. Yes. Um, Mar Margaret, could you put up the, the, the next poll question, please? Okay, what's the one thing uh, your organization needs right now to scale your COVID-19 in, in, uh, intervention? Since 80% of you said you've already started uh, COVID-19 interventions, we'd like to know where you think the gaps are, whether it's um, you know, a lack of uh, connect, you, you need connection to distribution networks, as we heard from Maureen, uh, Ashofka and other organizations are trying to um, distribute food, water, soap, etc. But maybe they need uh, distribution networks. Maybe it's volunteers, funds, um, link to a government agency. Uh, please just fill fill it out where you feel that. Uh, So Margaret, how are we doing on the poll? You're on mute, Margaret. Sorry, uh, <laughs> we're doing great. So far we had 55, 56% people are voting. Um, we give them like one more minute. Maybe we'll give them another 15 seconds or so. So if you haven't yet okay. uh, put in your response, please do so now. Um, and then Margaret will publish the responses for us to see. Sorry, I, I, <laughs> my internet uh, crashed for a second there. So Margaret, uh, can we see the results, please? Okay. Okay. 
funds uh, looks like the highest at 38 percent um and distribution of of network distribution network sorry uh links to government agencies interesting that food although maureen says that that's one of the main uh, issues it doesn't seem to uh highlight it, it doesn't seem to be so high on this agenda so funds are definitely at the top of the list for everybody okay um let's move on i want to introduce our next speaker thank you very much by the way jay and uh, maureen we appreciate that our next speaker is andrew waititu he's the ceo of of uh, Safe Hands Kenya. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nancy. I uh, hope everybody can hear me clearly. So uh, maybe what I'll start uh, by doing is just giving an overview of what Safe Hands uh, Kenya is, because this is not uh, your traditional organization. This is a coalition of different companies that came together just about three weeks ago. and. Uh, uh, have have already started having a little bit of an impact specifically in the informal settlements. So maybe if you go to the next slide, it'll give you an idea of uh, the companies that made up this coalition. And um, I think it's important to note that this says 6th of April. This has changed since. We, we have uh, more partners who have come on board. And uh, just to give you an idea of how this, this partnership uh, kind of came together, uh, basically, a lot of these companies are not the size of some of the larger corporates uh, that you find in, in Kenya and felt that if they came together, they could do a lot more uh, to try and impact, uh, you know, what's happening specifically in the, in the informal settlements, but then being able to grow uh, beyond that to address literally the, the whole country. So what the companies uh, were, uh, came on board to do uh, was to address uh, wash issues, so issues of sanitation, and we'll get to that uh, on the next slide. Uh, but the key things, no, just go back one slide, sorry. Uh, the key thing that the coalition partners needed to commit to was the suspension of the profit motive if there were services that were going to be uh, utilized uh, from them that were paid for. Uh, speed uh, to get to market and last mile saturation, which in a case uh, like addressing issues in the in the informal settlement is, is very important because you don't want to have to go to say, for example, a school or a chief's office and dump a whole bunch of products and, and cause some of the chaos that we have seen happening in the last few days. Uh, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, what Safe Hands was addressing is a large scale distribution of uh, soap, hand sanitizer, and surface disinfectants. We have since added masks onto that. Uh, but in essence, it was to look at the three major pillars of, of WASH so, uh, sanitation products, uh, sewage extraction, and water supply. And the first thing that we were able to do pretty quickly was address. Uh, the availability of products. So the, the partners that are involved in, in, in this coalition, uh, one of the things that makes them quite unique is that, number one, they have presence in literally all areas of, of the country, including the informal settlements. We're able to map out uh, what areas they are present in. We're able to overlay that with data around uh, population density, and then try and ensure that we're able to have enough product uh, that is able to saturate uh, each particular area in a very structured way and report back not only to our donors, but also to government in terms of, of how impactful we are. Additionally, this uh, is, is uh, you know, put, we have also put together a behavioral change campaign uh, which you may have seen on the first slide, uh, which is uh, speaks about you know we being the cure. 
So it's based on the premise that there is no cure to COVID right now. We have to be the cure. We have to change our behavior either through, you know, where we, where we go, how we, how we wash our hands, uh, staying away from touching people, uh, and literally just reducing exposure of, of, of people around us to uh, the possibility of catching something uh, from us if we, we have the disease. So if we move to the next slide. Uh, so on the consumer behavior part, I, I did touch a little bit on this. Uh, we are looking at access, ensuring that every Kenyan, particularly those in hard to reach areas, have access to the product. Uh, a communication campaign on education on behavioral change. So for this, we are working with different partners, including people like Shujaz that do the, the, the comic strip, uh, Village Creative that created the, the uh, visual and other media campaign that you probably have been seeing in the newspapers. And then we also have a user experience team that is looking at the actual products and how they are landing in each different space. So for example, we will not just take uh, your standard uh, you know, hand sanitizer that will be available in the shop, but try and see how can we work with the local community to provide a hand sanitizer, maybe wall mounted, that makes it easy for everybody to have access to. It could be at shops, it could be at eating houses, it could be in, in high uh, transit areas for people like Matatu stops. And uh, literally designed from the bottom up, something that can quickly be uh, put in place and utilized. And then what we do is ensure that that uh, station is filled with sanitizer every day. So moving to the next slide. Uh, some of the challenges and learnings, uh, I think uh, obviously this is uncharted waters for many people and we are working in a, in a landscape where regulation is changing literally on a weekly basis. So things like the partial lockdown that we have seen, uh, ensuring that we are able to get uh, our products across uh, some of the, the, the borders that have now been, been set up. We can't move in and out of Nairobi easily, uh, ensuring that our people are able to work within the curfew hours and get back home safely. Uh, last weekend, there was a regulation on food and material donations, so ensuring that our people are able to continue to operate. How do we continue to engage with government to ensure that happens? Uh, obviously, with the kind of scale that we are trying to do this at, uh, a lot of products must be brought in. Uh, if you look at sanitizer, things like ethanol, some of the gelling agents, we don't have enough of this available in the country, obviously because of the demand that uh, the situation has put on, on the systems that are already in place. So how can we reach out to where these materials are available? Uh, involve government to help reduce some of the costs, importation costs, duties, taxes, tariffs, uh, to be able to bring this so that each dollar that we are spending on, on these materials ensures that we have more of these products available to, to the people. Uh, so ensuring the, that we, the, some of the learnings, ensuring that we have an open channel of engagement with government uh, and keeping them abreast of what it is that we are doing. The fact that we are not a traditional organization approaching things in the traditional way has meant that we have to spend a lot of time in educating different uh, partners, including government, of, of, of what we are doing. And then uh, another one is the power of networks. A lot of these organizations uh, may not be as big as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, some of the other big corporates, uh, local corporates that we have here, but they have networks of people at a global level. And all the work that we have been able to do to date uh, really has been on the back of uh, philanthropic grants that we are getting at uh, uh, outside Kenya. We are in the process of setting up uh, you know, a local way to collect money, uh, and that will probably then also accelerate our ability to, to do much more. Uh, next slide. What we need, I think this uh, goes without saying, uh, because we, we, we are a medium to long-term solution, uh, yes, we have been created because of COVID and the challenge that COVID brings, but in truth, at the moment, we have more Kenyans, you know, especially in the informal settlements, impacted by 
sanitation-related uh, <clears throat> diseases or conditions, things like diarrhea, currently kill more people in a week than we have had in, in the whole of uh, Kenya die from COVID. And so we see ourselves as learning from this to be able to put in place a behavioral change that will positively impact uh, literally the entire country, hopefully, if we, if, we, if we are able to scale fast enough and keep uh, the funding going uh, beyond, uh, beyond COVID. So that is basically uh, who we are. Uh, thank you. Uh, the last slide basically talks about the, 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 the kind of branding that we are, we are putting behind this uh, coalition, which is, I basically says in, in Swahili, uh, I am the cure. Uh, we are the cure. That's the, the hashtag that we are using for this. So thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so much, Andrew. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. We have uh, some really good conversations going in the chat. Um, maybe, maybe I'll just pick out a couple, Nancy, if, if that's okay. Um, there's been quite sure, sure. A, a debate going around um, whether whether distributing food or distributing food vouchers or M-Pesa um, would be more effective for informal settlements. There was quite a couple of, of folks in the chat um, who are asking, you know, is it is it is it food that's the way to go or food vouchers or just giving money? Um, and and uh, I don't know, Maureen, uh, Jay and uh, Andrew, if anyone sort of wants to respond to that. Um. So, so maybe I could I could give it a, a bit of a, a go. This is something that uh, has come up within the, the coalition in terms of uh, distribution of, of food. Uh, as you know, as you may see, some of our coalition members are actually involved in that already. But we felt that you know some of these systems are already in in, in place, and although that is not our our mandate right now. Uh, we have been involved in conversations with some of the people setting up these response uh, mechanisms. And the thinking was that it would be uh, easier if you create an, an, a kind of e-voucher system uh, that would allow people to cash in uh, on different items and use the existing infrastructure, let them buy uh, their food where they know uh, uh, and, and who, from whom they trust. Uh, so use maybe uh, a mobile money platform to provide this e-voucher system, and which also allows them to buy things that may be beyond food that they still need on a, a daily or weekly basis. Um, Maureen, any thoughts on that? Yes, um, so if I may speak on behalf of most people here in Kibera is, um, I would say I'd go with cash because here in Kibera, M-Pesa does work, so I'd say there's both cash and M-Pesa because um, most of the people here, uh, they buy most of their goods from Kibera, within Kibera, and the level of exposure to some of these technologies is not very high for most of these people here in Kibera. So it means if you send a food voucher to them, they might not know how to use it or where to go and use it. Um, and the other piece is if it's donating food into Kibera, it needs to be done in a way that is very organized so that there will be no chaos or fights or fooding gets done before it has reached 20 more people. And one of the ways we can actually do that, because um, seen, I've seen a chat there, is partnering with organizations that are already doing that, that's number one, or identifying local institutions that already have access to the internal parts of Kibera and working with them do that kind of distribution. So I'd just say go with cash um, or M-Pesa, but vouchers, it will be pretty hard. I, and if I can just, add to what uh, Maureen said. Thank you, Maureen. I, I, if I can add to what Maureen said, there was a problem. First of all, let's remember that on this platform, uh, when we talk about M-Pesa or, or um, you know, some of us, even when we talk about Kibera, uh, we have people on this platform today that don't necessarily know what we're talking about. So um, uh, please explain yourself. So M-Pesa is the uh, mobile uh, app that allows us to move money around in, in Kenya, and it's widely used. 
Um, but I do know that last week there was some issue around uh, people buying things with, with M-Pesa and then reversing that transaction. So a lot of people are asking for cash, straight up cash, because they, they feel like they can't trust M-Pesa right now through, you know, in, the, in this COVID era. But um, I had, a, a, there's somebody else here who's also asking, is Safe Hands working with others, not just to deal with sewage extraction, but the safe handling and transfer of bodies of the de deceased? Um, we, we haven't had high numbers of deaths yet in Kenya, but maybe this is something um, we need to start uh, thinking about. And Andrew, maybe you could uh, respond to that question or if you know somebody who, who is uh, thinking about that right now. So the, the short answer is, is no. And um, you know, back to your, your point, uh, luckily, touch wood, we, we haven't had uh, as many uh, deaths in, in Kenya as they have in, in other countries impacted by COVID. And all the deaths uh, have primarily been in, in uh, you know, institutions where these people are under treatment. Uh, so uh, the hospitals and the rest, so the, the, they're able to manage that. Uh, as safe hands, uh, the coalition of companies, uh, we are not uh, healthcare practitioners, so we would not be placed to be able to deal with that. Uh, and hence, uh, we, we were very kind of uh, deliberate around what our mandate is and what managing what we can. So safe hands is really looking at the wash aspect and even the, the issue of distributing masks uh, created a lot of debate within the coalition, but we felt again it's something that we probably can do as an add-on uh, service. But as as many of you know, the whole issue of masks has been a very uh, heated one around reusable masks, single disposal, uh, where do they go after that, and and all that. So it's still stuff that we are we are dealing with. Great, thank you. Maureen, somebody's asking, uh, can you give us a little bit more context on, as I mentioned, not everybody knows uh, when we say Kibera, they don't know what we're talking about. Uh, Kibera is an informal set settlement here in Nairobi. And somebody's asking, you know, how many people live in Kibera and what are the, what, what kind of um, housing do people have or how many people are living in per you know per uh, house on average how many people uh, live in one house um so uh, thank you very much um so kibera is one of the largest or i think the second largest slum in africa um, at the moment and it's a very congested um place and in terms of the number of people living in a household, I'm not sure about the figures um, at the moment, but I can check on that and try to spend it out. Um, but the last time um, I looked at the data in terms of the number of people per household, um, it was roughly between five people, a minimum of five people in the household. Most of them are elderly um, people and um, it cuts across elderly and the youth also at the same time. Um, and for the number of people in Kibera, I'm not sure about the figures at the moment. It's something I can just look it up, then get back to you on that. Great, thank you. Um, oh, there's also a discussion around um, verification. When donors are giving funds, we, we've seen that, you know, most, most people on the call today are talking about, uh, are, are have mentioned that it's funds that are needed, but when do, how do they verify uh, that these funds have gone to the right places? And especially if it's like cash transfer or, or food distribution. The other question is how do you identify the most needy in, in, in some of these uh, informal settlements? Because as we saw recently, only a week ago, there was a stampede for food People uh, were hurt. I think even one person died. Um, and some of the people who were actually distributing the food, as, as Maureen said, were stealing the food at the same time. So uh, um, those are two questions. Uh, maybe uh, uh, whoever wants to attempt to answer that, please do. 
Um, I can try with the first one. So the question is, how do you verify that things have been done as they said they would be or been sent to where they get sent? And this is an extremely interesting and important question. Uh, you're fundamentally asking, how do you create trust in a low, low trust environment? Um, people aren't used to institutions being trustworthy. They're not always used to it being advantageous for them to tell uh, the complete truth because there's a lot of people taking advantage of all sorts of other people. Um, this is not a, a judgment on any people for the record. It's the institutions and the situation we find ourselves in. And it's very difficult. Um, you find that the institutions that are better at getting money are often the people who can tell the better stories. Um, there's fraud that comes up. Um, a lot of people start with good intentions, but over promise and then under deliver. And, you know, historically this has been solved with effectively rule of law and trustworthy court systems. People create agreements, they create ways of tracking them, and they follow through. And there isn't a totally complete answer to this. I think for cash transfers, you can solve it quite easily because everyone's SIM card is connected to their ID. And people might have multiple SIM cards, but those should all be connected to the same ID number. So in theory, you could get the numbers of people, um, get rid of any duplicates, you could ask the telcos who's in a specific area, and then you could literally just send them cash that way. And then at least you know that the cash got to a specific place. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about how do you create trust and how do you make sure people are following up on commitments? How do you get small actions to aggregate into bigger things? I'm happy to talk about that more uh, offline. I'll send my email. But I think it's a very big, uh, tough, tough question. And that straight delivering cash is one of the easiest ways, given the penetration of M-Pesa, where you, you at least know that cash went to a specific person, and you have a pretty good idea that you're not sending cash to multiple, to the same person multiple times. So maybe I can touch a little bit uh, from on the, on the other aspect, which is uh, in the case of, of Safe Hands Kenya, where we are trying to raise money and get uh, you know product out one of the the first things that we had to do was get on board a partner who would try and keep uh, us honest so pwc is a financial uh, an accounting partner so doing everything from uh, project cost management uh, so some of our partners are providing us services at cost so pwc would do audits of that to ensure that we are we are getting, you know, bang for the buck, so to speak. Uh, so that way we are able to go back to our donors and, and say, yeah, this is what we used your money for uh, to be able to try and get X amount of product uh, in front of X amount of people. Uh, the other aspect, uh, uh, which I've just touched on, which is uh, around how do you ensure that things around this coalition as mentioned is the use of 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 data and uh, feedback a way to kind of feedback so you'll not see any huge donations happening uh from safe hands kenya you know in in a, a big i don't know chief's office or a, a school where we tell people just come and collect stuff uh in some of the things that we have piloted uh last week we were in kibera we we're actually doing door to door uh, handovers of, of soap and surface disinfectant uh, to the different families. So that way we are able to then provide feedback again of where this product has gone. Uh, so there's, there's different ways to do this. Uh, some of it is slow. We are learning as, as we go ahead. Uh, but hopefully we can then create a blueprint that can be used in, in, in future emergencies uh, beyond, beyond COVID. Great, thank you. Um, Maureen, there's a question for you. Somebody is asking, you mentioned M-Pesa is unreliable at the moment. Why exactly is, is that the case? Um, so I will not fully say it's fully unreliable. I think there's one person who mentioned there that most people like after a transaction has occurred, somebody um, reverses it back. Um, so that is just one incident that I can talk about. Um, but I would not like fully say it's unreliable. I'm just saying 
will need to ensure that once a transaction happens, uh, nobody will reverse it back. So that means the other party doesn't get what they deserved to get. And if we are going to use, um, yeah, I'll just say that for the moment, just being keen on when transactions happen and uh, when they actually do not happen, because most people have multiple uh, SIMs registered with multiple different names. So today I might call with a number that is registered to Maureen. Tomorrow it's registered with my second name. The next day it's registered with my third name. So you might not, not end up knowing who is who from these three people. Yeah. Um, and then somebody had asked about uh, how many people live in Kibera and uh, one of our, our uh, participants answered and said, uh, anywhere between 500,000 to 800,000 residents, but the key, the figure changes because a lot of the people um, um, move move around. So, um, yeah, there's there's the answer for that. Um, I saw another question here about uh, uh, Nancy. Nancy, test, I think it's also, about it's also important to Sorry. to to kind of put that number in context. I believe. That number, that half million number, live in about uh, three square kilometers. So it's not a big, it's not a big area. Yes, yes, it's a very small area, and even the rooms are are very small. When when Maureen talks about five to six people living in a house together, the, the, these are very small areas, very very small uh, accommodation. There's also a question about testing and whether we can use the current HIV AIDS uh, testing infrastructure to, to, um, to test for COVID-19? And uh, if at all, uh, do we have data on how many people within, let's say, Kibera have, have, posted, uh, have uh, tested positive? Um, do we know if there are any cases? Um, at the moment, uh, there have been no cases that have been identified um, in Kibera, um, but I had there's a rumor going around um, that uh, the health system or department was to come into Kibera and test uh, most of the Kiberians. So I'm just waiting to see if that actually happens or it was just a rumor. But till date, we've not had any cases in Kibera, um, but a testing will be done soon if the rumors are true in this case. The government has actually announced that they're soon going to start mass testing. Uh, we haven't had that uh, in Kenya yet, so maybe that's why uh, you heard some of those rumors. Um, there's also a question about how to build how to build trust with community leader, leaders and how to sustain it, uh, especially when we don't know how long this situation will last. Our our um, are churches being used or church leaders being used? Are, um, you know, how, how do you build trust in, in communities like Kibera? Um, so one of the ways uh, you can actually build trust with communities in Kibera is, um, at the moment, I would say uh, the different youth women centers and institutions that have been operating in Kibera for long and they have been um, like engaging and involving the community people in the different projects they are working on. Um, the other way is also just working with nonprofit organization or community-based organizations that have been operating in Kibera in a long period of time. And what I've seen with most of the people in Kibera is if you engage and involve them in the different activities either your organization or institutions are doing, they tend to accept and feel that they have some sense of ownership. And when most of the people in Kibera feel some sense of ownership, they would want to ensure that that initiative is still there and it's actually uh, doing good than bad to the community. But if you don't involve them, um, they tend to fight back and not in a good way. Um, and there, uh, there was actually an incident. Yeah, they tend to be very suspicious. suspicious. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you short. There was an oh, yeah. incident. Uh, actually, there was an incident where um, 
like an organization was employing people outside Kibera and not employing people who are in Kibera. And um, some of the youth they actually just went to that place and were like, we need you to employ our youth who have actually gone to school then going outside Kiber and bringing in people and not supporting people who are from here. And that was just a message that they were sending that we have people who are educated. Why not give them opportunities so that they can improve their own livelihoods than going outside and leaving the people who are from here. So one of the ways yeah, just yeah. we are doing that. Thank you very much. It looks like we've come to the end of our uh, session. We're almost at the end of the session. I wanted to ask one last question to all the, our participants today, um, because we want to do these kind of uh, webinars on a weekly basis every Thursday. So I'd like to find out from you who you'd like to hear from, if there are particular people you'd like us to invite as speakers, and what topics uh, you'd like us to, to, men to talk about. It seems that uh, one of the main topics might be around funding. Uh, Um, what, 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 what I think we lost Nancy there for a second. So I, I, I think what Nancy was going to close with was to say, um, how, how, how else, to, I mean, these sessions are geared to help Africa learn from, um, Africans learn from each other and, and uh, move around solutions um, that especially affect the most vulnerable as quickly as possible amongst African countries. And we're starting with Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa as our, as our initial centers, but actually we're very open to listening to interesting solutions from um, other African countries. So you please know of, of interesting solutions that are being applied in informal settlements, uh, rural areas, um, looking at uh, places like uh, applications in public, crowded public transport and those kind of things. Um, we'd be very happy to, to engage with you. Um, and um, don't get limited to uh, programs, technology, um, or, or, or communication uh, pieces that are doing uh, some innovative stuff or impactful work. Uh, in terms of getting involved, uh, there's a slide that you, you're able to see now that talks about various ways you can get involved. There are existing platforms in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, uh, and the existing working groups. Um, and it also includes the, the uh, organizations that were featured today, um, um, covered by the guest speakers, Tuna Panda and Safe Hands. Um, all these are opportunities for people to plug into, should you wish to, to get involved. And uh, there are email addresses there for Rachel and Nancy. Um, please send them an email, let them know uh, of your interest, and we'll make sure we connect you to uh, the right people. Uh, but otherwise, um, appreciate your time. Um, is there any other slide, George, beyond this one? Yes. So here are just some final details of, of, of people. And once again, um, it's a real pleasure to have you hosted on this. As mentioned, this will be held every uh, Thursday. Uh, we'll make them very dynamic. We'll make them very topical, very interesting. And due to the nature of the COVID-19 response and the pandemic, things uh, are going to be changing on a weekly basis. And we're going to try and make sure that we as much as possible are able to bring you relevant information uh, to help you uh, do what you're doing better on the front end and uh, help you better understand this condition, protect yourself and protect your communities, and hopefully we can all crash the, crash the curve. Others, apart from that, um, uh, thank you. Oriel, any closing remarks from your side? Thank you so much, Frank and Nancy, and thank you once again, Maureen, Jay, Andrew. Um, really insightful conversations. 
I will leave the chat uh, and the meeting open for a few more minutes. So please do, for those of you who are adding your suggestions for these topics, please do keep putting them in. Um, we're gonna have a sit down and sort of plan out what the next few sessions are. So if you have topics, if you have speakers that you would like to recommend, um, just feel free to please go, go ahead and keep populating them in the chat and, and we can go through that um, in detail later. So we'll leave that up for now, but thank you everyone for your time and really appreciate you spending your morning or afternoon or wherever you are um, with us. So th thank you all very much for joining and we look forward to seeing everyone next week at the same time. Mm -hmm.